What's up everybody, welcome to another video. So behind me here, I have one of the very first projects that I ever shared online. In fact, it's so old that it predates my YouTube career. This bookcase is made from 100% solid African mahogany. It's got these cool little industrial exposed fasteners and overall, it's just one of my favorite projects that I've ever built. So in today's video, we're gonna recreate this bookcase, but with a couple of important design tweaks. If you've been watching my channel now for a little while, you probably know that I really like to work with fancier woods like walnut and the aforementioned mahogany. I mean, if you take a look around this living room, you're basically swimming in walnut. And I don't mind spending a little bit extra on wood because I know I'm gonna be keeping a lot of these pieces that I make for the rest of my life. But at the same time, I don't wanna alienate newcomers to this hobby. I don't want people to watch my videos and think that you have to spend a lot of money to build something that looks cool. Similarly, I know not everybody has the same massive tool collection that I do. So for this build, I'm gonna be focusing on using basic tools and at every step where possible, I'll be giving you alternate tools you can use to do the same job. That's right, everybody. It's a good old fashioned budget build. So for less than a third of what it cost me to build this bookcase, I'm gonna show you how to build this one that's been hiding just out of sight this entire time. What do you think? Not bad, right? So in total, I spent 256 Canadian dollars building this bookcase. And if I'm being completely honest, if I was a little bit more careful, a little bit more patient, I probably could have got that material price much closer to an even 200 Canadian dollars or about 150 US dollars for my friends down south. Not bad when you consider you could easily spend that much money at Ikea on a particle board bookshelf. And I haven't even mentioned the best part yet. Since it's the holiday season and I don't really have any use for two nearly identical bookcases, I'm going to be giving away this bookcase at the end of this video. So make sure you stay tuned for that. All right, I think that's it. Let's jump over to the shop and I will show you how I made this thing. Well, now that we're done with the intro, let's start talking about the construction of this project. So like I said before, the, uh, you know what? I gotta get that out of my face. All right. So like I said before, the biggest substitution we're making is we're replacing uh, mahogany with pine here. So in front of me, I have a bunch of two by 12 mold and grade pine that I bought from a local mill for about $5 a linear foot. I bought 24 linear feet of it, which is honestly more than we need, but it's better to have too much rather than too little. So the first thing we have to do is cut this down to length. So we need five pieces that are 36 inches long and then four pieces that are 13 inches long. The first, and I think the best way to cut your pine to length is using a miter saw. It's quick, easy, and very accurate, so long as you have a decent saw. Alternatively, you could also use a table saw along with some sort of cross-cut sled, or in my case here, I just have a miter gauge set to zero degrees. Lastly, and probably least expensively, you could use a simple circular saw in combination with a speed square. If you're on a tight budget, this is probably your best bet. A decent circular saw can be had for under $50 and a speed square can be had for under five, so long as you don't mind it being made out of plastic. Just take your time, cut slowly, and make sure that the guard of the circular saw is making good contact with the speed square the whole way through the cut. After I had everything cut, I gave all of the pine a quick sand using a random orbital sander and some 160 grit sanding pads. A quick sand helps the finish to adhere to the wood better and also helps to remove any small surface imperfections of the wood. If you don't have access to an electric sander like this, pine is soft enough that you could probably sand it all by hand. It would just take a little bit more time. Oh, and a dust extractor like the one I'm using here really helps to minimize the dust while you're sanding and keep your work area nice and clean. Okay, so now that the wood is cut and sanded, we are ready to start finishing it. Honestly, I think part of the reason that pine gets such a bad rap as a wood to work with is because it's really hard to stain it and have it look nice. A lot of people will try to stain pine so that it looks like more expensive woods, but the problem is it usually doesn't take the stain very well. It gets really blotchy and it just ends up looking bad. But there is a solution for that. All you have to do is condition the wood prior to staining it. So this is a wood conditioner that we're gonna to apply to it. And then we're going to apply this stain and finish in one to make it look more like a walnut. I've actually never used this product before, but I'm curious to give it a shot. Let's see if you can stain 
and finish in one step effectively. I'm not sure how exactly wood conditioner works, but the effect of it is pretty dramatic. If you've ever tried to stain an unconditioned softwood before, you know that there are parts of the grain that just will not absorb the stain. That's what creates that blotchy and uneven look. Wood that's been conditioned, on the other hand, accepts the stain much more evenly and in turn looks a lot better. Following the instructions on the can, I applied the conditioner generously, waited 15 minutes, and then wiped off any excess using shop towels. 15 minutes after that, I started applying the stain. Wood conditioner is kind of funny in that you have a window after applying it where it's most effective, so make sure you don't leave it for more than two hours before applying your stain. Brushing on the stain was pretty straightforward. First, I made sure I completely covered the piece I was working on. Then, because it's a stain and a finish in one, I'd go over the piece with big long brush strokes to make sure the stain was evenly distributed. I'll be honest with you, I probably won't be using this finish again. I wasn't super impressed with it. It had a tendency to pool, and despite the conditioning, it was still a little bit blotchy. Some of that might be user error, but in the future, I still think I'll take the time to apply the stain and the finish as two separate steps so that I have more control. This finish feels like it's trying to do a little bit too much at once. Keeping up with our price tally, the wood conditioner and stain added $20 to the cost of this build. Okay, so that's all stained and uh, I guess that's the finish applied too. So while this dries, we're going to start cutting all the metal for this project. Just like with the wood, I'm going to give you three different options for cutting your metal brackets. The first method is just to use an angle grinder and a metal cutoff disc. This is actually the method I use for many years and it's surprisingly easy. Just mark your cut lines with a sharpie and then carefully trace them with the blade. You want to make sure that you mark both the horizontal and the vertical surfaces so your cuts end up nice and square. I'm using a big 60 volt cordless grinder here, but you can find corded angle grinders for under 50 bucks. As always, cut slowly, carefully, and make sure you're wearing protective gear. The second way you could cut these brackets is using a reciprocating saw or a hacksaw. It's a little bit slower and a little bit harder to get nice straight lines, but it's definitely still an option. I'm using a carbide tip saw blade here, and while they're a lot more expensive than conventional blades, they're definitely worth the money. They cut way faster and they last a lot longer. I've sawed through multiple 12 inch steel I-beams using a single blade and it was still sharp enough to keep cutting. No matter how you decide to cut your angle iron brackets, you're going to need eight that are 16 inches long. I bought three four foot long angle irons for 60 bucks at Lowe's and frankly, I really overpaid. Had I bought them from a proper metal supplier, I probably would have paid half of that, but I was in a rush and Lowe's was the only thing open that day. The final and probably the best way to cut the brackets is using a metal chop saw. It's fast, super accurate, and it takes all the guesswork out of getting perfectly straight cuts. It's my favorite way to cut metal, but it's also the most expensive. In order to screw the brackets to the bookcase, I needed to create some mounting holes. So I drilled a quarter inch hole at the top and the bottom of each bracket using my cordless drill. Drilling through metal isn't that tough, but if you find yourself having trouble, try starting with a smaller drill bit and then slowly working your way up to the size you want the hole to be. That should help to make it a lot easier. Prior to painting the brackets, I gave them all a quick sand to smooth their rough exteriors using 160 grit sandpaper, and then I wiped them down using mineral spirits to remove any oil or metal shavings that might still be stuck to them. Then it was time to give them a coat of paint. I bought an $8 can of flat black paint and primer in one and sprayed on several coats over the course of a couple hours. I did the insides first, and then I flipped them over and did the outside last. Okay. So we got all the finishes applied, or at least the first coat on the wood, the metal's ready to go. So give me a second to reorganize this room and then we are going to start assembling this bookcase. I'm gonna take all my pieces and start laying them out on the table. First one, this is my bottom. This one goes here. It doesn't really matter which piece goes where, except for the bottom one. I want the little maker's mark to be on the bottom. It's there. And then last but not least, this one goes here. Okay, so now in order to secure all these together, we're gonna use dowels because I've decided that I really like working with dowels. After doing the prismatic table build, I found myself wanting to experiment more with dowels and this seemed like as good an excuse as any. On the horizontal pieces of the bookcase, I marked out six locations for dowels, three at each end. Then I clamped together two horizontal pieces with a vertical piece sandwiched in between and drilled out the holes for the dowels. Each hole was a half inch wide and four inches deep. In order to make sure I was drilling all my holes to the right depth, I wrapped a little piece of tape around my drill bit as a stop. 
There are fancier ways to do this, but I've always found that the tape works quite well. Once the holes were drilled, I squeezed a little bit of wood glue into them, spread it around, and then hammered some half-inch poplar dowels into the holes. The dowels were pretty cheap. I bought two four-foot long pieces for $4 each, and that was enough to do the whole bookcase. 20 minutes later, after the glue had set, I saw the dowels flush using a flat saw. Unfortunately, I marred up the wood a little bit while cutting the dowels flush. If I had to do this project again, I'd probably wait until after the shelf was fully assembled to stain it. True, it might be a little bit awkward to reach some of the interior corners that way, but I ended up having to sand and restain the whole bookcase to fix these marks. More on that later though. Level by level, I continued drilling out holes, filling them with glue, hammering in my dowels, and then sawing them flush. Once I got past the first row, I actually had to switch to my little 12 volt cordless drill because the larger 20 volt drill wouldn't fit between rows. This is a good example of why you might not always want to buy the biggest version of a tool you can get your hands on. Small tools can be very handy too. Assembly took a little while because I had to wait for the glue to dry after completing each new level, but slowly the bookcase began to take on a zigzag shape. I cut off the last few dowels and then contemplated how I was going to fix those ugly saw marks. Eventually, I decided that I was just going to have to sand and restain the whole bookcase, so I used some 120 grit sanding disc to smooth out the imperfections around the dowels, and then I used 220 grit sanding disc to sand everything else and prep for another coat of stain. Again, in retrospect, this is probably the point where I should have applied the first coat of stain, but hey, you live and you learn, right? The next step was installing the steel brackets. I carefully clamped the brackets in position so that I didn't scratch the paint, piloted out some holes, and then screwed them in place using these big heavy-duty lag screws. I spent $30 on a box of 50 lag screws, but really, I only ended up using 16 of them, so I still have a bunch left over for a future build. I really like these screws. Each one is rated for 240 pounds of load and shear. They're painted black from the factory, and they have a really wide head on them, so you don't need to use a washer with them. Overall, I think they really add to the industrial look of this bookcase. Piloting out each hole prior to inserting the screws helps to prevent the wood from splitting. Soft woods like pine are generally less likely to split, but with big screws like this, it's always a good idea to pilot first. Bracket by bracket, I worked my way around the bookcase, and by the time I was done, I had a structure that was extremely rigid and ready to support a small library of books. So we are almost done. It's all sanded, everything is assembled. The last thing I'm gonna do, and I'm probably gonna do it and then take off for the night and come back in the morning and finish this, is just apply one last very light coat of stain, just to cover up all the little spots where I sanded and where I inserted the dowels. The second coat was a little bit tricky. It had to go on very thin because at this point, the wood wasn't able to absorb much more stain. If I wasn't careful, the stain slash finish had a tendency to drip and pool in awkward spots. I took my time and did my best to brush out any imperfections, but it was really challenging to get an even application. Add that to my list of complaints from earlier, and I think you guys probably understand why I'd have a hard time recommending this finish. Regardless, I pushed through the challenges, applied the stain, and finished what I'd started. Okay. All right, that's it. I'm gonna let this dry overnight, and tomorrow I'll come back, take it home, and I will go home and shoot the intro and outro to this video, because. I do everything out of sequence for some reason. All right, see you guys in like 24 hours. All right, here we are back at home. We have the new bookcase next to the original one that inspired it, and we have one last little job left to do, and that's just to install some little felt pads on the bottom of the bookcase so when you slide it around on hardwood floors, it doesn't scratch them. I'm a little annoyed because I had to spend $10 to buy like 50 of these little felt pads, which kind of pushes me over the target price point that I had for this build. I really, really wanted to hit 250 bucks, but I think with the 10 I spent on these, that brings us to like 256 or 258. The nice thing about this is that despite the fact that it's really quite large, because it's made out of pine, it's not crazy heavy. I mean, it's probably, I don't know, maybe, 60, 70 pounds, something like that, but I can lift it pretty comfortably by myself. As mad as I am that these felt pads blew my budget, I am pretty happy that I found them. In the past, I have been using adhesive pads, but I much prefer the mechanical connection of these pads. It's a lot more secure. All right, everybody, that's it for this build. So 
Like I said in the intro, I'm going to be giving away this bookcase to one lucky viewer. In order to enter, all you have to do is just comment down below with your Instagram handle, and on January 1st, 2021, I will be announcing the winner on my Instagram page. The only catch is that this contest is open only to Toronto area residents. And the reason I'm doing that is because this thing is just too massive to ship. So the only way I can get it to the winner is by putting it in the back of my truck and hand delivering it. So with that being said, thank you so much for watching. Good luck to everybody who enters. Happy holidays. And as always, if you like this video and you want to support my channel, the number one thing you can do is just make sure you're subscribed and, you know, maybe give it a thumbs up or something like that. All right, everybody, I'll catch you in the next build. I almost forgot, I still have to do the stand test to make sure it can support my own body weight. Oh man, it's definitely gonna tip over. My weight is fully on it, but it's falling back. Does that count? I mean, I know I'm not on top of it, but my whole body weight's on it. Okay, see for real.